good and we, that's how Haitian Creole sounds. And last, two weeks ago, uh, Sunday morning, just about this time, I was standing in Haiti in front of about 2,000 people in the Light and Peace Mission in Bodo where we began our, our, our meeting, our greeting with them. And uh, so it was an awesome event that I was at. It was at the annual convention, and the 50 churches that are associated, they all sent people to this one main church, and we had uh, about 20 people from each church that came out to about 1,000 people that stayed for the weekend. And they were sleeping in the pews, they were sleeping in the church, in the school, under a tent, they were all over the place, and it was just a, an unbelievable event. So I just want to start with the kids, or the kid. <laughs> Come on up, you can see better up here. Come on up. On the Come on up, you can sit up here. You just have to watch out for the wires, that's all. So this is a story about a typical little boy in Haiti, and it kind of a little bit, but this is... that that 
and Tanner could have some water. So there's the little boy and the buckets, and it's the kids' job to go and get the water in the morning. As soon as they wake up, they go out and they have to go to wherever the well is. And sometimes the wells and the lakes are pretty far away, but they have to walk and walk and walk till they get to the well, pump the water, fill it up, and carry it back. And that's before they can drink anything, before they can brush their teeth, before mom can even cook in the morning. They have to go get the water. So during the day, most moms uh, try to make a little bit of money too. They don't just stay home. A lot of them have little tiny uh, baskets that they sell, oranges, and some of them sell lemons and fruit. And so this lady looks like she's going to be selling bananas. Now, you see how she's carrying her bananas? Later on, after the service, I think I can show you how you can do that too. It's not so hard. Do you see anything on her head besides the pot? A little pillow? Yeah, it's like a t-shirt or a wash of a towel, and they roll it up and pin it together, and then when they put the thing on their head, it makes it kind of flat. So that's their secret. There's mom now. What has she got? She's got, it looks like she might have a bag of charcoal on her head. Because if they don't have electricity, that means they don't have electric stoves, they don't have gas stoves, they don't have anything but charcoal. It's like when you cook outside, sometimes people use charcoal in their grill. So that's what she's carrying on her head. How many of you go to Walmart? Have you all been to Walmart? Probably, huh? Well, that's the Walmart in Haiti. They don't have too many indoor stores. Most of their stores are outside. And so people bring their stuff and they put it out in the road and they put it all in the marketplace. And when you go shopping, that's how you go shopping. Remember I was talking about charcoal? So if you're going to cook your meals, you have to buy charcoal. And that's one of the boys carrying charcoal home. How would you like to do that? Not too much fun, huh? Okay, and that's how they, you see the big pot and the little pot? Underneath it are rocks, and underneath the rocks are the charcoal. And that's how they cook. Now, these ladies are actually cooking for a school, and that's why the pot of rice is so big. So who's that helping the lady? Who's that blonde lady? <laughs> no, that's a few years ago. <laughs> okay, that looks like a, a school bus, doesn't it? Well, it is a school bus, but when you paint it and it's in Haiti, it becomes what they call a tap tap. Now, tap taps are named that way because when you get on the bus, you get on, but when you want the bus to stop and you want to get off, you have to on the side, you, you put your arm out and you bang on the bus, or you bang on the, the whatever it is you're in, and that's called a tap tap. Here, hold on. See, this is another tap tap, and basically anything that has wheels becomes a, a tap tap. This looks like a truck, but in Haiti, it's another tap tap. And you see that lady, she's calling to the driver and saying, hey, wait for me, I'm gonna get on. It doesn't look like there's a whole lot of room unless you wanna sit on top, but that's probably a cool place to sit on. Well, there's another tap tap. It looks like a pickup truck, doesn't it? With seats in the back, along. they have long boards on each side. But they get a lot of rain in Haiti. And when they get a lot of rain, they get a lot of mud because they don't really have too many roads that are paved. So this tap tap got caught in the mud. You can't even see the wheels on it, can you? It's so far down in the mud. But that was like the big, the big entertainment for the day. <laughs> <laughs> Things are kind of quiet in Haiti, and when somebody gets stuck in the mud, that's that's a big attraction. So they had a. I think they must have had a lot of fun getting that truck out. Do you think it was fun standing in the mud and pushing the truck and, until they finally got it out? And everybody's watching. I think they gave a big cheer when they finally got it out. Now, 
you saw the good house, um, and you saw the bad house that was kind of broken down. This is one of the churches. It's a church and a school, and it doesn't look too good, does it? This one has, um, it's made out of branches, just branches, and a, a broken roof. And what happens when a hurricane comes by, when you have a big wind and rainstorm? What do you think happens to that place? And that falls apart. So they have to put it back together again every time they have a hurricane. Now, if you don't have running water in your house, if there's no toilet that you can flush, what do you do? Where do you think they go to use the bathroom? Well, they have to go down the street. They don't have them in their house. They have buckets, so you can pee in the bucket if you want, but if you want to have a real toilet, more or less, you have to go down the street, and that's called a latrine. Whoa, that's what's inside the latrine. You really want to go and use that? No, but that's what the kids at the school and that's what the kids outside have to use. Not very pretty. Okay, here's some of the kids at Johnny's school. Now, does that look like your school? No, not really, huh? What do you see, what do you see that's different? Does it look very sturdy? This is kind of the inside of that church that you saw. And you can see that some of the walls are made out of sheet metal. And look at the poles that are holding up the ceiling. Does it look like they're sturdy poles? No, they're just tree branches, huh? And do all the kids have desks to sit at? No, not really. Now here are some of the older kids. And what do, why do they all look alike? They're all wearing uniforms, aren't they? If you wear the same clothes, that's called a uniform. So all the school kids in Haiti wear uniforms. And you can tell what school they go to by the color and the style of their uniform. So there's the church again, and that's on Sunday morning. And that's all the kids that got together and they're going to church. They're all dressed up in their best clothes. And you're going to hope it doesn't rain that day because if they're inside that church and it starts raining, what happens? Everybody gets wet, huh? So that's outside of school, and some of the big kids are jumping rope. It looks like it's rocky on that ground, doesn't it? Do you think they have any shoes on? Some of them don't look like they have shoes on, but they're still jumping rope on the rocks. Now, there are poor kids in Haiti, and there are some very poor kids in Haiti. Now this is, these pictures are taken in a place called City Soleil, which means Sun City. And it's one of the poorest places in all of Haiti. And so you can see by the houses, they look terrible, don't they? You wouldn't want to live in there. It was after a rainstorm, you can see the puddles, you can see the pig walking around. It's not a good place to live. These are some of the kids that live in that place. These are children that um, their, their parents have died and they have no place to live, so they're going to live in an orphanage near that, near that place, City Soleil. And these are the same children, and if you don't have a mommy and a daddy, who's around to love you? Huh? Sometimes they can live with relatives, but even relatives are so poor, they just don't have anybody to live with. So they go to an orphanage. So this is our orphanage. Okay, these kids look a lot better, don't they? These kids came to our church down in Haiti and needed a place to stay. And they looked like those other kids that you saw when they first got to the orphanage. But now look at them. They look pretty regular kids, don't they? They got good clothes on. They're, some of them are smiling. The, the, the building, the wall behind them looks nice. It's painted and clean. They all have shoes and socks. And they're holding boxes and they're showing off their new shoes because some of their American friends sent down some shoes for them. And here's some more of the kids as they get a little bit older. You can see some of them are a little bit bigger now. They've got school supplies and some other things that they need. And 
They even get to celebrate birthdays. Most kids in Haiti don't have birthdays because they don't, they don't even know, some of them, when their birthday is. And they don't have any money for presents, and they don't have any time to celebrate. But these kids at the orphanage have a lot of fun. And they're getting bigger. Can you see they're growing and getting bigger? Okay, these kids just moved into their new house. They were living in another house in another town. And these are the orphans that, that are part of uh, my father's house orphanage. And they just moved into their new house. And it's a beautiful, nice place. You see that? We got, <clears throat> they spring got grants from some friends and they gave us money and we were able to buy land and build a big wall around the, the orphanage. And that's the orphanage, so that's where those kids live now. It's the best place in Haiti, don't you think? <coughs> um, sometimes Americans want to send down stuff for the kids. They need to send down clothes and you know uh, shoes and, and things for their bedroom. They need beds and they need sheets and towels and all this stuff. So they put it in boxes and they put it in a big, big container. That's called a container. And there are the boxes. They're bringing all the boxes filled with all the clothes and shoes to the orphanage. What do you think they are? Mattresses? Those are the beds that the kids are getting. Those are the bed, the bunk beds. Do any of you have bunk beds? And those are the kids in the truck. That's why they used to get to school in the tap-tap. That's their own tap-tap. It wasn't very decorated, but it's still a tap-tap. But one day, somebody donated a bus. And so that's the kids now. That's the bus that he's now getting in and out to school. So those are the kids at the orphanage, and they're kind of getting bigger and bigger. That was taken about two years ago. That's the school they go to. It's a nice looking school, huh? Those are some of the kids at the school. Wait a minute, who's that lady in the middle? <laughs> Who, who's that? Tracy, Is that her? <laughs> That's my daughter, Tracy. And that's my granddaughter, Heidi. And those kids are having a, a good time with some people that live very near you. The team, if you see those little white faces back there, those people are from Trinity Methodist Church in Hackettstown. And they were down visiting the orphanage and all the kids. And so they're happy now. That's another team that came down. You can see on the right is my husband. And there's a, there's a boy over there. That was my, my souvenir when I first went to Haiti. I met this little boy, and he just got himself attached to me, and his daddy was dead, and his mommy couldn't support him, and we ended up adopting him. So now he's, he was a baby, he was five years old, and now he's a big guy, 21. So those are all the kids at the orphanage, wow. We started off with 26, and now we have 57. Actually, we started with five, but the first picture you saw, I had that 26. So those are all the kids, and that's what we were gonna show you about Haiti. We thought that you would like to know about what it's like to live in Haiti, and that's how the kids are now. Is that okay? Where would you like to live, here or Haiti? Here? Here. Here, I think you're right. Thank you for being so quiet. I appreciate it. Sure. I was going to say thank you, Carol. Um, you got to do that without ever getting officially um, introduced and recognized. I think some of you have heard me say um, how I came to know this family is um, I had two boys, and some of you know where my house is. It's kind of isolated, and our our next door neighbors were Tracy and her three girls, and so they kind of all grew up as a, a group together. So I, I got to know Tracy 25 years ago, something like that, and then through her and, and her daughter. Um, Hi. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then her mom, Carol. And just by um, knowing their family and hearing stories about um, Haiti and Day Springs Ministries, um, I realized I didn't know all the details, how things got started, and where you were now, and so it's wonderful to have you come here today and, and tell us 
how you got started in the, the whole story. So thank you. Well, it started by accident. Not really accident, but I didn't know what we were getting into. Um, we had a, I had triplets, and Tracy is one of them. She has two identical brothers. So we started off kind of like by surprise. Um, but the triplets grew up quickly, and then I was kind of like an empty nest when they went off to nursery school. So we adopted a little interracial girl named Allison, and she was a baby. And then she got a little bit older, and I thought, you know, I've got these three little blonde-haired kids and this little light black girl. Um, maybe she feels lonely, so we adopted a Korean girl. So this was just, I don't know, we didn't, we didn't plan on doing everything this way. When we got married, we didn't think we would have three kids and then do that. But that's what happened. And then as time went on, there was a, the Vietnamese um, crisis over there in Vietnam. And we sponsored a family, our church, and there was a young boy, 12, 13 years old, and his father was off to work, and his mother hadn't come over, and he had no place to stay, so he came and stayed with us. So when we had five kids, then that turned into six kids. And then, um, I don't know, kids just started coming to our house, and, and somebody recommended that asked us if we would take this one girl who was having trouble at home. So we said, oh, okay, you know, when you've got five, six, one more isn't gonna make any difference. So she came and stayed with us. But then she left, and, but Dyfus had become involved with her family. So when they knew we took one kid, they came back and said, well, we have two kids. Could you take these brothers and sister? So, well, okay, we could do that. You know, so I don't know what that brings us up to, around seven kids. And before we know it, knew it, there was another one and another one, and even Tracy here brought home one or two from school that <laughs> needed a place to stay temporarily. And some of them were very temporarily, but then there are others that are still part of our family now, five or six of them that are still like family. So um, we ended up, at times, having 10, 12, kids all together, including my own five, I guess, at that point. We always had teenagers, which was okay, because my kids were getting older and they were teenagers. But I had gone to nursing school, so I could be a missionary nurse. Like, I didn't have enough to do. But anyway, after I graduated, they had a baby that was on an infant monitor for sudden infant death. He was premature. And they asked if we could take him. So I said, okay, you know, so he came to join us, and eventually, four years later, he was adopted. And during that time, we just had more and more kids, and it was, it was an interesting time to have 10, 12 kids living with us, and we did that for about 20 years. Um, it was, it, Tracy knows it wasn't always easy. She always had roommates and different roommates, and. Um, we had some very troubled teens with us, and um, we had a lot of ups and downs with some of them. But um, it was a, a fairly uh, controlled chaos. We had a lot of rules that we had to obey, and um, certain times to do homework, certain times to have ice cream, some certain times to watch TV. And so we were, we were just doing our thing one day when a deacon from our church was praying for our family, and he said, God bless the ministry that Carol and Bruce have to these young children. And it was like, ministry? What does that mean? We're just doing foster care. But it was at that point that I realized that that's what God had called us to do. And so we were doing it joyfully, and it was very exciting, and we did it for 20 years. And just as we were retiring from that, and, and that's when Dayspring was really formed because people wanted to help us out financially, but we wanted accountability, so we opened this ministry called Dayspring Ministries, and people could donate it to it and, and help you know, support some of the kids. But as we retired, um, Tracy's brother Rob went down to Haiti with his church, and he was down there for about 10 days, he came home, he really felt God was leading him and his wife to go back again. 
So they went back for three months, and while they were there, he would call me and say, Mom, you really should come down here. It's like, why would I want to do that? And he would call and call, and finally one morning I woke up, and it was like God was telling me, I want you to go down there. So I did, and um, that was the beginning of Day Spring in, in Haiti. You can see the conditions that people live in, and um, there was one church down there that Rob was staying at, and it was the Light and Peace Mission. Pastor Ronald LaFranc was the pastor. And during his time there, Rob really was impressed with the honesty, the integrity of Pastor Ronald, that he did what he said he was going to do. He wasn't out to get anything more than what God was giving him. And he was uh, just a good, sound, honest man. And from that experience, that's what Day Spring is based on, because that's the man in Haiti that we work with. And he's an amazing guy, brilliant guy. He controls everything that's going, not in a, a controlling way, but he's in charge of everything that's going on. Right now, we have 10 schools that we support down there. As I said before, there are 50 people that, I mean, 50 churches that come together. And uh, he's in charge of all of that. And uh, we have the orphanage with 57 kids. So that's how it got started. But if we have a couple more pictures you can look at. We're going to go through these quickly. So one of the things that makes Haiti so poor and desperate at times is the natural disasters that occur there. And in the year 2008, there were four hurricanes that came along and just wiped out. Go to the next picture, Haiti. That's a major city in Haiti. And it, it's not, it's near the water, but it's not that the water came in from the ocean. It's because they have no way to cook their food other than charcoal, which means they've been cutting down trees, cutting down trees. It's 99% deforested in Haiti, so when the rains come, all the water comes down the mountain, and you can see what a mess it is. The flooding that takes place during the hurricanes is amazing, and people have to leave everything that they have. Up in the mountain, churches where they have a lot of farms and stuff, they're, they're kind of, um, what do they call that, in the terraced farming, and the rains come, all of their crops are washed away. Their houses are washed away because the storms are so strong and their animals are washed away as well. Um, we were happy because Day Spring began to be known among certain churches and people and when these disasters occurred, they would donate money and we were able to buy rice and beans and um, new farming implements and seed and things that they could do to rebuild. So there's Pastor Ronald on the right, and the other guy is one of our pastors up in the mountain churches, and he's distributing some of the rice to those churches. That was what happened. That was a regular, you know, rock solid church. And then when the hurricane came, that's what was left of it. So after that broke down, they built their own little church out of branches and twigs, and that's what they used for school and church for a long time until those people from Teaneck, New Jersey came along and they were on a mission trip with me and we were visiting the place where the, earth, the, the hurricane occurred and they decided they would help. So their church began uh, sending money to rebuild and it's coming along and at the end, that's what their new church looked like. And they're really not too many people. We have other pictures where there's like 100 people out front um, back before the earthquake in 2010, um, I think you all are familiar with the earthquake. That was a major event. That's what the palace looked like. That was the seat of their government, and it was a beautiful building. After the earthquake, that's how it looked. Um, we were down there 10 days after the earthquake. I went down with a team of uh, doctors and uh, nurses and EMTs, and there were ten of, seven of us. and. Um, we were able to uh, go to our little clinic and help the people and everything else. And it was, it was horrible as we drove around Port-au-Prince because
because it was one building after another after another. The streets were barely passable because of the rubble all over the place. And the ministry buildings were beautiful, big, white ministry buildings with the green roofs on them. And they were the ministry of the treasury and social work and, you know, all the government buildings. And they seemed to have been built very poorly. They looked nice on the outside, but they weren't built well. And they just, the, the, the sides gave in and then the roof just came down on them. And, you know, it's hard to imagine 300,000 people. I mean, we're very disturbed because there were 3,000 that were killed in, in uh, the World Trade Center. But this is 300,000. If you can imagine the Ohio State uh, football stadium, it holds 100,000 people. And if you ever see them panning around, you know how much 100 is. And so three football stadiums of people died. Everybody in Haiti lost somebody. There's not anybody in Haiti that didn't have a relative or friend that somebody got killed. When we were going down, Pastor Ronald called us and said, make sure you bring a mask and some Vicks to put under your nose because there are dead bodies all in the street. And as they, they, didn't, they couldn't bury these people, so they just brought them out and laid them in the street and big trucks came by and they just pick them up and throw the bodies in. And there's a place that we visit on every mission trip where they scooped out, these big trucks scooped out a big ravine and then these big trucks would come in and just dump the people into them. And you can see that on YouTube, too. It's, it's a terrible sight. So that's one of the other buildings. So that was our little clinic that we had at the time. That's one of the nurses from Morristown Memorial that came down with us. We have our medical director, one of our trustees, Dr. Judy Banks, and she's an uh, obstetrician at Morristown Memorial. So that's our president of Dayspring. At the time, he was the pastor of my church, the First Congregational Church in Chester. And he uh, was an EMT, and so he's out there helping out. Those are just some of the kids that were in the neighborhood and saw that I was giving out candy to some of them, so they lined up to get some. When we used to go to Haiti, we couldn't uh, stay at the orphanage. There was no room at the orphanage where we could stay. So there just happened to be a lovely hotel nearby, very nearby. It was very convenient, and if we put four in a room, it was a reasonable rate. So we used to uh, stay there, and on the left, there was a big open area that was probably twice as big as this room with poles that held up the second floor where there were bedrooms. But underneath, it was all open and they would use it for graduations and weddings. And when we were there, that's where we would eat. The mission teams would eat and they would serve us our food there. Well, that's what happened after the earthquake. Now, you might have heard that the mission team from Trinity Methodist Church was on the orphanage during the earthquake. And they were outside playing in the, in the yard, which is about a three acre piece of property. And they said the land started rolling toward them. They heard this big boom. They didn't know what that was. And then the land was rolling and it just came toward them. And they all dropped to the ground. And it was like 40 seconds of this, and it went right through. They looked around the bus that was there, kind of went almost over, but didn't. Some of the walls around the outside kind of collapsed. The cow remained standing, and the orphanage remained standing. The kids had been living in this other uh, house that I was telling you about. And December of 2009, they had to leave that house because they were something else was going on and they had to move into the orphanage, but the orphanage wasn't quite ready yet. And I was like, oh God, why, why do they have to move in it now? It's, you know, it's still rough cement on the floor. The toilets weren't working inside. They had to still cook outside. And it was just, you know, it's Christmas time. It was December. It would have been so nice if they could have stayed where they were living. Well, January 12th, the earthquake came. And had they been living where they were living, the house collapsed. They lived on the bottom of a two-story house. And it was dinner time. They would have been inside, and they would have been dead. The Trinity team 
was staying at this hotel, and they were supposed to be eating dinner, but they were on the orphanage grounds out in the open. And the people at the hotel called them and said, it's time for dinner, we have your dinner ready. And they said, you know what, we're having fun with the kids, just, just keep the dinner, we'll be back later. And had they been eating dinner where they were supposed to be, they would have been dead too, because that's, that's what it looked like. So after the earthquake, the kids and everybody in Haiti were scared to go inside because any building could, you know, with the aftershocks, all could have collapsed again. And so people were sleeping in streets and back alleys. They, they would not go inside, certainly not to sleep. And even though the orphanage remained standing, they were just, the kids were afraid. Everybody was afraid to go inside. So they all started sleeping outside. They moved their stuff outside. We got tents. Dayspring was able to bring tents down and send more. So that's, I mean, it was just God, God's blessing on these kids and on the people. Um, it's an amazing thing. We were able, Dayspring got an enormous amount of money. I never would have believed. We got $400,000 sent from people all over the country. I mean, who knew about Dayspring? You know, it was just me sending money down and people from my church, and, but people from all over wanted to send money and to help, but they didn't always want to do it through a major charity where a lot is taken off for, you know, uh, administrative work and everything else. Dayspring, 98.5% goes right to Haiti. We have newsletters that I send out once a month, and that's the only expense. Nobody in the United States gets a, gets a salary. So we hired teams. We had three teams like those guys to go out and dig out the people because everybody was living in rubble. Or everything was collapsed. It was just the next one in. That's how the streets looked. That's how the alleys looked. Wherever they had, their houses were collapsed. Everything was collapsed. And so this team came along. Now, this is where they, they didn't want to go in the church. The church didn't collapse either. It was strong and it lasted, but they were afraid to go in any building, so they were worshiping outside in the, the schoolyard under the tent. So this is when Dayspring had originally gotten in Haiti, and that's how the first church looked, and that little guy on the end, on the left, right side there, that's Stephen when I met him. Um, so that was the first ch church. This is when they needed to start expanding, so they started rebuilding the, the church. And then this is how it basically looked when the earthquake came, and it still looks the same today. So it was just God's hand again on this, on this church and the buildings that's inside. Now this was taken two weeks ago at the annual convention that I was at. And um, one thing I wanted to show you is the work on the side. For the longest time, there were no railings to the second floor. They had built it and they just didn't have enough money. And you know, every team that went down there was like, you know, just waiting for an accident to happen. So the boys at the orphanage, um, we hired a welding teacher and we taught them how to do welding. And every Saturday they would get out there with their teacher. And so they built that and that goes all the way around. So this was the first time I had seen it when I was down there two weeks ago, and I was really impressed. They did a good job. Oh, there's Pastor Ronald and that other blonde lady that you know. Um, Pastor Ronald is awesome. He's gentle and kind. He's about 6'6", six, six, which is probably the tallest man in Haiti. People in Haiti don't really grow too big because of the nutrition or the lack of nutrition, and they're usually pretty skinny. But being fat down there is a good <coughs> sign. People like to see their pastors heavy because that means they're prosperous and doing a good job. Um, these are just some pictures that I have that are just random pictures. This is our newest little baby at the orphanage. He came about two months ago. He was very sick and weak and everything. His mother was in labor up on the mountainside. She wasn't delivering and they took her on a stretcher on their shoulders and marched down the mountain Halfway down the mountain, she had the baby, and then she died. So the father you know, took the baby and his dead wife back up the mountain. He tried to keep the baby alive with broth and bread, but after a couple of weeks, that wasn't working. So they brought the baby down to 
the orphanage. And so the baby is here, but after a month, the baby started having some infections and they tested it and the baby, baby David is uh, HIV positive. So um, they've already started him on antiretroviral uh, you know, therapy. And so hopefully he'll do fine, but he's, he's a sweet little guy. He's in the hospital now, so if anybody wants to pray for him. That's just our little boys going off to church on a Sunday morning. They look so cute, don't they? Down there, when you go to church, you better look good. Um, the men, if you have a suit, you're wearing your suit, even though it's 90 degrees. And the ladies always look perfect, and they have their hair, you know, every, they look nice. We have necklaces, and I forgot to bring some, but we have these necklaces that are made out of ladder trellis yarn, and it's got like two, two little pieces of yarn with little pieces of ribbon in between. And when you crochet them, they're very lightweight and they look like beads. And they're just beautiful. And the girls make them. We sell them for $10 and they go like hotcakes. So it's a good way to raise money for the orphanage. Again, the uh, Methodists are, are coming down there every year and they uh, bring t-shirts for the kids. So these are some of the school kids with the new t-shirts that they got. So most of what we do down there, I mean, we are involved with the schools, we have 10 schools, but the Bible says that God's heart is with the widows and the orphans. And so those are the two people that we really, that Dayspring is really involved with. We have 33 widows that we support because they're alone, and even if they have some relatives or family, nobody can. You know, nobody's rich down there. They can hardly feed their own family and then to have grandma stay with them or whoever. Um, so we, we take care of those widows. We give them food every week. We give them bags of rice and beans and whatever they need. They take it home, maybe they share it with their family, but they get, they, they get that. And also we have the, the, the orphanage, as you saw, we have like 57 kids now. We got three new ones in the last two months. So it's an increasing population. After the earthquake, uh, we doubled the number of kids in the orphanage, and there's still about 400,000 kids in Haiti that are homeless, or they're living in situations that aren't good. It's, a, it's an overwhelming number when you hear these things, 300,000 people died. You know, how do you, how do you even imagine that 400,000 kids roaming the streets or, you know, living in substandard conditions. But we can only do what we can do. And God has somehow, somewhat chosen us to do this. And he's been faithful to do everything that Dayspring has done. Through the, the churches around and individuals, we've built the orphanage. We had a foundation that was friends of ours that gave us hundreds of thousands of dollars to buy the to buy the property, to build the wall, to build the orphanage, to build the pastor's house. Churches here have adopted churches there and have built new churches. A lot of the churches still are built with sticks like you saw. Um, there's schools that we support down there, not 100%, but we have 10 of them that are related schools. So we're doing what we can down there, but God is always ahead of us. And I'm, I'm always amazed that I have never done, or any of us have really done, um, a fundraiser. God is our fundraiser. I just, I just sit at my computer and I get an email from somebody that says, Carol, we want to donate, we want to help this church. And they've come on mission trips with me and they've seen it and they've just said, we want to help. So I just, you know, I'm very humbled to know that God chose me for this job. I, I, I wasn't prepared for it. I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't know I had a job. And it just grew. But it's, it's a beautiful thing to sit back and, and just see God at work in Haiti through the people at the Light and Peace Mission. And so this is, this is what I do every now and then, talk to people. We just share testimonies. We don't have car washes or, you know, big dinners or anything, but yet, I don't have to worry about it. That's not my job. God promises to provide for his people, and he's doing a good job for those people in Haiti, so I'm, I'm, I'm blessed. I'm blessed to be here, and I thank you all for inviting us to be here, and it's really nice to meet you all.
Well, it happened to be that you have to choose a denomination in Haiti to be a, a, a recognized church. There are many little individual churches where people get together. But if you want to have any of the, the privileges and rights of a full-blown church, you have to align yourself with one, and they became aligned with the Baptists. But the Methodists come down. I mean, we've had people, different churches join us and people that went down to Haiti. Um, but Christian. Do they have to firmly renounce any Buddhism before they join the Baptist church? Yes. Absolutely. Oh no, I mean, this is just the Baptists, and there might be others, I don't know what the Methodists, they, they probably don't want to be involved with voodoo either, but voodoo is still going on down there. I mean, there's a lot of people that are just voodoo people, they don't send their... No, they, they call themselves Catholics. Yeah. But as I said, you know, we can be Christians, but people still recognize Santa Claus. You know, so voodoo to them is more like a cultural thing, but they do have their ceremonies. Well, yeah. Well, they they don't have to reestablish themselves. The voodoo people are very established. So if a Christian church comes in, okay. Well, that hasn't changed. The that's a part of it. I mean, the culture down there embraces voodoo. Um, and also other religions. There are Mormons down there, and you know, a variety of different Seventh day Adventists are there. But the Baptist Church makes them renounce any connection to voodoo. Well, I can understand that, of course. Yeah. But they still have a culture, though, too. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Are you, uh, just as an aside, I'll tell you that my parents were um, Methodist, well, they still would be if they were alive, but. Uh, were Methodists in Illinois, and they went to Haiti um, many, many times with their church. But um, are you aware of any uh, secular organizations that are organized that are, are working in Haiti? Oh, there education? are many. Uh, yeah, there are many or humanitarian organizations are down there. Do you know the names of some of those? Or? Um, I think if you went online, Google just humanitarian organizations in Haiti, you'll probably get more than you. You know, there are a lot of, it's very easy to work in Haiti because it's a, a, a four hour trip from JFK or Newark to Haiti. You don't have to go across the world, you're not going across the ocean, you're not going to Africa, and it's a non stop flight, is what we get on over in JFK. So it's easy. So there are a lot of American ministries down there and a lot of humanitarian groups as well. Well, we're just beginning to deal with that because our kids are, we have some boys now that are 17, 18, and 19. We've sent them all to secondary school, which is like a high school, but it goes a little bit longer. They have to go through third to grade 13. And so we've got one graduating this year. He um, has a sponsor in the United States that would love to bring him to the United States for an education. So we're kind of working with that. But that's why when they've always did the welding, we have an electrician that's committed to going down there um, to help the boys learn uh, electricity because that's coming into Haiti. They don't have a whole lot of electricity, but they are getting more and more. And so I think we need some good electricians down there. And we just got a grant to purchase a property half the size of the orphanage, which would be about an you know, one and a half acres, and we're gonna build a boys' dormitory for the teen boys, because now it's time to move the teens 
away from the team girls. And uh, so we're looking forward to doing that and then also providing some other vocational training, barber shop work, stylist for the girls, uh, the welding, the plumbing, the electrical, you know, concrete block working, making, we want to have a bakery. So we're trying to, you know, we're, we're just getting there. Is it a language, John? Is that French? No, Creole. They speak Creole, which is pretty much combined with French. So it's it's, um, Haitian Creole was the African dialects that they brought over. Oh. So it's a, it's not a hard language to learn. I'm, I'm doing pretty good at it. <laughs> That's it. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.